Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about today is some lessons that I've learned um, in terms of dealing with security advisories for a number of Apache projects. Um, the focus of my talk is going to be on Apache CXF, uh, one of the web service stacks at Apache, uh, but the lessons can be applied to, I think, a number of uh, different products as well. So today, I'm going to start off with talking about the security advisory process. Oop. The security advisory process at Apache. Um, I guess many, many of you will be familiar with this. Um, it applies to all the projects. And then I'm going to talk about some issues that might be associated with this process and how you might resolve them. Uh, the meat of my talk is I'm going to delve into nine or ten uh, security advisories for the Apache CXF uh, project. I'm going to describe the advisories and talk about the lessons that you might learn from them. And just to make the talk a bit more interesting, I'm going to demonstrate two of the advisories uh, in practice. Okay, so just, I guess I've already been introduced, but I work for Talend. Um, and I work across a number of different Apache projects. My main interest is in security. Um, so the Apache Santuario project, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is the XML signature and encryption reference implementation of Apache. Uh, Apache Web Services, self-explanatory, Apache CXF web service stack, and Apache Syncope, which is a, a new project at Apache on identity management. OK, so I'm going to briefly run through the security advisory process at Apache. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is somebody discovers a security flaw. Uh, there are a number of different types of people who might discover this flaw. So the first one listed here is a security researcher. So a security researcher could be somebody associated with a university. Um, for example, there's a university in Germany that have reported uh, numerous security advisories. Uh, to across some of the projects that I work on. It could be a, kind of a white hat type person who, um, who does extensive analysis of the code base and finds some issues. So these are people that kind of group in the professional security category. Uh, the second uh, type of end user is um, maybe the opposite end to this is somebody who's using your project and they're puzzled about the output of a particular configuration. So they're trying out some new functionality or a new use case, and they're puzzled about what they see. And the third person is somebody who's maybe in the middle, so a developer on the project who suddenly realizes that uh, the functionality that they see um, is not what they're expecting. OK, so. We've covered the types of users who might see a security issue. So the next step is they have to report the issue. And how they report the issue varies according to the type of person who discovers the issue. So the first the security researcher, who tends to be a kind of professional, will know to uh, they might communicate with the security expert on a project. So for example, I've received private emails from these kind of people saying, listen, I think there's an advisory in your project. Or they might know to email the private mailing list of the project, um, which is only accessible to the uh, PMC of the project or an Apache member. Or they may email the security at the, the security mailing list of the project. Uh, the second person, the Apache developer, uh, they'll probably know how to handle security advisories, and they may email the private at to alert the other uh, members of the project. Or they may just keep it secret until it's been fixed and then tell the project, OK, fix the bug in the project. The third group of users, so the non-Apache users or developers, uh, they may not know the proper way to uh, report a security advisory. And uh, this is something I'm going to talk about later, as it may cause some problems. OK, so the issue has been reported to the project. So the next step is to verify that the issue actually exists. Um, some issues that are reported may just be misconfiguration, or an end user may be expecting something that may not actually be the case. Um, so a good way of verifying the issue is to write a test case to reproduce it. Um, and this may verify the issue. 
Okay, so we've written a task case. We can re reproduce the issue. The security experts of a project um, agree that there is an issue in the project. So typically, you would inform the reporter, yes, we agree. Thank you for reporting the issue. And uh, you may just uh, discuss a possible fix with the person who reports the issue, or maybe internally you'll discuss the fix. Uh, then you'll email the security at apache.org uh, mailing list, and you will receive a CVE number. So this is an, an advisory number. OK, so we verified that the issue exists. So the next, problem, uh, the next task is to fix the issue. Uh, so once you agree a fix, you uh, commit the fix. Um, typically, you may use a, a misleading or a vague uh, commit message. Uh, so this is to make sure that, um, I guess, potential adversaries may learn that there is an issue via your commit message. Um, if the fix is, the fix may be specific to a certain environment, so maybe it only, the bug only exists on a particular platform that you may not have access to. Uh, so in this case, you may ask the person who reports the issue to uh, validate the fix themselves. Uh, then you backport the fix to, to all active branches of the project, if this is applicable, um, so the, if the bug exists in these branches. Uh, so after this, the security pro team, they draft the advisory. So you talk about the flaw without giving too many details, uh, the versions of the project that are affected, the commit which was fixed, and the project versions uh, that the fix uh, will be in. And the final stage of this process is to actually release the fix. Um, you sign the advisories, put them onto a special advisories page in the project website. Uh, after this, uh, you publicize it, so you um, email it to the users list, maybe an announce list in the project, as well as, well as some kind of bug tracking uh, mailing lists. So I've given an example here, so I'm just going to briefly look at this. OK, so this is the security advisory page for Apache CXF. It contains a list of advisories, group by year. And you can just click on each advisory, and you'll see assigned. OK, I'm not connected to the internet. <coughs> this is a cache page. OK. OK, so that's the security process at Apache, roughly speaking. So there are a number of potential issues that may arise um, out of this security release process. So the first one I briefly touched on was that uh, an end user, probably somebody who isn't associated with the project or who isn't a professional security person, may actually publish the issue by logging a JIRA, or they may ask something to the user's list of the project. Okay, so to keep it concrete, here's an example. This uh, security advisory, which I'm gonna talk about later, is an authentication bypass, and this was actually first reported in JIRA, so JIRA CXF4776. Okay, so this obviously is not, <coughs> is not good because a book has been published before a release has been done uh, containing the fix. Okay, so we can't moderate the Apache mailing list. There's no point because um, it may have already been propagated to a mirror. Um, we can't, well, we can kind of moderate maybe the bug tracking system depending on what it is. Um, I don't think we can delete issues in JIRA, which is why I said we can't moderate it. So there are a number of things you could do to mitigate this kind of premature disclosure. Um, you can change JIRA issues so that they can only be seen by um, project members. Again, this isn't ideal, but it's a way of mitigating this type of problem that I described in the last slide. Um, mailing list disclosures, you can just email the person who made the query and say, listen, this is potentially an advisory, please don't uh, mail the project mailing list about this again, and we'll talk to you about a, p a potential fix offline. And then finally, you can uh, document the reporting procedure on the website uh, in the hope that somebody who thinks they may have a security advisory will read it and go to the correct channels. Okay, another potential issue is the timing of the release. So we fix the issue, project has to decide when do we actually release it. Um, so if you have a kind of a critical bug, so something like an authentication bypass or something, it may warrant the immediate release of a project. Um, however, there could be a number of other issues in the works. So it's typical in some of the projects I work on that there could be two or three advisories on the go at, at the same time. 
And if this is the case, you may choose to delay a release until all the advisories are fixed. So this, would, this is to avoid releasing issue and then having to release another, do another release two weeks later. It may look bad too. Um, well, people use projects and commercial pro products and it's not really fair to people to be putting out critical releases all the time. Okay, so we've done a release. Another potential issue is dis uh, disclosure timing. So the normal practice is that um, after you do your release, you'll disclose the advisory, um, put it up on the website and mail it around to public lists. Um, but it, this, it, we, we may delay this to allow users time to upgrade, um, particularly maybe if it's a critical bug, you might allow, you might give some time for, for people who use the project to upgrade so that when the advisory is released, they're already using the upgraded release in their projects. And then finally in this section, there may be a number of disagreements. So I've touched on some of them. So one of them might be that the person who reports the issue may not agree with the fix. Um, they may not be happy that the fix addresses the problem or something like that. Uh, we've, developers may disagree in the release timing. So particularly if you have developers who, from different companies who use the product, uh, they may, want, may not disagree or they may not agree on okay, we put this issue out next week or I want to delay it because I've got a product coming out in two months' time that uses, uh, uses this product. Uh, there can be issues of backporting fixes. So um, if a bug exists in an older branch of the project, um, people may not be happy with backporting fixes, but they may break backwards compatibility. And there's no, uh, there's no great solution to any of these problems with a robust PMC with a kind of a fair chair can help uh, with mitigating the problems. Okay, so the meat of this talk is that I'm going to go through a number of advisories, mainly on, on Apache CXF. Um, I'm going to describe them and, and talk about the kind of best practices that I've learned for, as a result. Okay, so this particular problem I touched on earlier, uh, CV 2013 it's up in the uh, CXF website. So this is an authentication bypass. Um, okay, so this is in, in the realm of SOAP. So for those of you who aren't aware of this, uh, we've got an XML message going, from, uh, going to a recipient. Uh, auth authentication is achieved via a username token. So this is basically a username and a password. Uh, that they're sent in a header of the request. So the recipient will typically parse the username token that it receives. It'll hand off the username and password for authentication to some kind of backend, like an LDAP directory or uh, Active Directory. Um, if authentication is successful, uh, then typically uh, we use WS Security with WS Security Policy. So WS Security Policy allows people to codify what the security requirements are. So for example, uh, for username token, you will have a username token policy. And the service will, after authentication, the service will check, okay, I've received a username token and it meets the policy that is applicable for my, uh, for my endpoint. Okay, so this particular attack was that normally username tokens are used for authentication where you pass a username and password. But there's another use case where you can use them for uh, deriving keys. <coughs> Okay, so typically when you sign a request, uh, you'll reference, uh, it'll, you'll normally be using an asymmetric signature, so you'll be re uh, referencing a private key corresponding to an X59 certificate, or maybe a symmetric key uh, derived or from Kerberos. And this particular use case, it's you can derive a key uh, using a secret password uh, from username tokens. Okay, so this is an edge case uh, I don't think anybody actually uses this in practice, but it's in the specifications, and we supported it. So the, um, the conclusion I'm going to draw here is that make sure supporting these kind of edge cases, maybe that nobody really uses, doesn't actually weaken security for your entire project. Okay. So the next one is to beware of legacy features. So this advisory, CV 2012-5633, um, so this was a reasonably serious uh, bypass. So typically, so 
if you have a service endpoint that uses WS security, this, we can basically bypass this using a HTTP GET request. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate this attack. Okay, so I have a project here which I use to uh, test some attacks on uh, CXF. Okay, so this attack was against CXF 2.7.0. So I'm just changing the version of my project to match this. Okay, so this is a Maven-based project. I'm just compiling it. And I'm using the Jetty plugin to, I have a, a number of end, service endpoints that I'm deploying on Jetty. Okay, so Jetty is started now in uh, 8080. Okay, so I'm going to switch to a web browser. And okay, so uh, the service endpoints I've deploy deployed are SOAP endpoints. Uh, this is a really simple double-it web service. So you send a, a double-it request with a number, and you get back the doubled response. So this is the WSDL. For those of you who aren't familiar with WSDL, it describes uh, an interface for a SOAP endpoint. So if you scroll down, you can see a number of endpoints that I have here. OK, so typically, uh, you, would, uh, you would have a SOAP client, and it needs to send some security requirements to the endpoint. Uh, so to demonstrate the attack, I'm just going to copy this URL. OK, so this is the attack in a nutshell. So this is a SOAP endpoint. So you might ask, how can we? How is this possible that I can just type something in a URL and get uh, the double response, the SOAP response from the endpoint? So the answer is that this was due to a legacy interceptor that allowed uh, REST style access to a SOAP web service in CXF. Um, as far as I know, nobody really uses it anymore. It was supplanted by the JAXRS standard, but it remained in the code. And somebody was very surprised one day when they realized that they could send this REST or HTTP GET request to a SOAP endpoint and get a response. And in this case, it completely bypassed uh, WS security processing. OK, so <coughs> while this is, was a serious attack, it, it only applied in certain circumstances. It didn't work with WS security policy. And also, it, it relied on a simple SOAP service that could be mapped to a HTTP uh, URL. And the conclusion I'm drawing here is just when you're releasing a new major version of your project, uh, don't be afraid to remove legacy features. OK, third advisory, CV 2012-0803. OK, so this is where, you, again, you have username tokens. So username, password, and the SOAP request. And this was a pretty critical bug where somebody could send a request to the endpoint with no username token, and the policy would still be marked as valid. So again, we had numerous negative style tests, but we had no negative test that sent no token at all. Um, this, again, was not really widely applicable because typically somebody would have plugged in a JAS style validator to validate the username token via JAS. And in this kind of case, uh, the attack wouldn't be applicable, but still it was a serious, um, serious problem. And the lesson learned from this is, well, apart from writing negative tests, it's, it's a good idea to review the specs uh, every now and again, read through various, your various types of requests and say, OK, what would happen if I, rather than sending this expected uh, message, I sent something slightly different, and what would happen? OK, my next advisory. Uh, so this was a note on an advisory because it wasn't actually a problem in CXF itself. Uh, so this uh, exploited a weakness of the PKCS number one public key encryption scheme. And it could be used to recover a symmetric encryption key. Uh, so typically for WS security, when you're encrypting the request, you generate a symmetric session key to encrypt the request. And then you wrap this uh, key and use the public key of the recipient to uh, encrypt the session key. And this, OK, I'm going to describe it in a bit more on the next slide. but. One of the conclusions to draw from this is 
is to make sure that you don't accept weak algorithms. So uh, define what algorithms are allowed for your various operations. So signature, encryption algorithms, digest algorithms, um, and your code should abort before, like when it re receives a signature or encryption blob that needs to process, make sure you abort before processing it. Uh, WS security policy is perfect for this, which is why we recommend that it's used for WS security um, because it contains an algorithm suite policy uh, which defines a set of acceptable algorithms. Okay, this is this really the same issue as the previous slide, but it's a different point. It's to beware of timing attacks. So the previous vulnerability involved a timing attack. So like I said, we have the symmetric key, which is encrypted in the header, which is then used to decrypt the payload, typically the soap body, or maybe username token. And this instance, because you've got two separate steps, an advisory could use a timing attack to see if it crafts a particular message to, to the service endpoint, does uh, decryption fail when you're decrypting the public key, or does it fail when you're decrypting the, uh, the payload? Okay, so these attacks are quite hard to defend against. In this solution, um, apart from specifying an algorithm which wasn't vulnerable, uh, we generate a temporary key if uh, an exception happens when you're processing the, uh, de when you're processing the decrypted uh, secret key. Uh, so th this makes it much harder for an adversary to tell where decryption failed uh, because this temporary key will be, will be used to decrypt the payload and processing will fail there. Okay, on a similar note, um, this is again a note on an advisory as it wasn't a bug in the product itself. Uh, this is an attack on XML encryption using CBC mode. So when you're using encryption, you specify a mode. Um, and this could be used to completely decrypt an encrypted request. So it's a serious attack. And there's no defense against this attack um, using CBC mode. But the problem we're faced with here is that WS security policy, which we use to define uh, what algorithms are acceptable, it doesn't actually define any non-CBC mode algorithm suites. Um, so the only solution we could, we could come up with here was to introduce custom algorithm suite values that people could use in their, pro in their products. But obviously this is not ideal because it could only be used by uh, CXF users. Uh, we alerted the, the mailing list of WS security policy, but as of yet, there's been no uh, resolution. Um, using GCM mode is Galois counter mode. This is an authenticated uh, encryption algorithm uh, which the attack doesn't apply against. Okay, probably the most difficult or most applicable attacks in terms of a web service is uh, denial of service types attacks. So CB 2013-2160 uh, described a number of different attacks um, on the CXF endpoint. Um, so these are based on XML. Um, so there's a number of different attacks. You could send vast numbers of elements with the goal to slow down processing or maybe cause an out of memory exception on the endpoint. A uh, huge number of attributes, maybe a very deeply nested tree. Hash collision attacks where you, you try to um, have a number of hashes that are the same so that it slows down processing on, on the server side. Uh, so the fix for this was that the Stacks XML parser that we use, Woodstocks, uh, was to be able to configure acceptable values for each of these things. And uh, we came up with a set of sane defaults uh, to avoid these kinds of attacks. OK, so the conclusion I'm going here, well, apart from just to be aware of DOS attacks, is to something you can do is that there are a number of automated tools you can use to see if your endpoints or your stack are vulnerable. So I'm going to demonstrate this attack. Okay, so this security advisory was against CXF 2.7.3. So I'm going to change my version in my project to load up this. Okay, so I'm starting it up. So now the tool I'm using is called WS Attacker. Um, it's a SOAP UI based project. And it was developed by the guys who reported these um, issues to me. Okay, so you've started, you started up, uh, you paste in the wisdom of your endpoint, so I'm just going to copy this here.
Okay, so then I select uh, an interface. It's going to stick with one. Okay, it generates a test request based on the WSDL. So this is my doublet request. So I'm just going to test this to make sure that it actually works. Okay, and the dreaded uh, demo failure. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try and fix this quickly. It was telling me there was a problem with one of the endpoints in my test. So I'll start it up again, see if this works. So my test request. Yes. So this is a successful request. So we can go into we have the plugin configuration here. Uh, there's a number of different types of attacks. So we have various spoofing attacks, which I'm going to cover later. Uh, we have signature wrapping attacks. And then we've got a, a stack of denial of service attacks here. Um, so the two that are applicable here, we've got a hash collision attack here and a coercive parsing attack. So I'm going to attack overview and start. So this takes a while to run. So if you can see the console output here, this is the just a log of input and output messages from the uh, CSCF endpoint. And you can see that the project is bombarding it with various types of requests. And I'm just going to leave that run in the background because I think it takes uh, a few minutes. OK, so in the plugin, there were, you can configure spoofing attacks. CV2012-3451 is a SOAP action spoofing attack. Uh, so this could be used if you've got a, a WSDL operation with n numerous operations. You could kind of spoof a SOAP action and try to execute the other operation. A uh, similar attack is CV2013-2172. This is a spoofing attack on XML signature. Um, this is similar to the thing about uh, earlier about specifying what your acceptable algorithms are. So this exploited a weakness in XML signature canonicalization method where it wasn't restricting the set of applicable uh, algorithms that could be used. And you could specify various XSLT and XPath uh, algorithms that could be used to spoof uh, signature validation. Okay, it's still running. And a related issue, just be aware of XML in, in general. It's so vulnerable to various issues. We've got an issue here where CXF proce processed uh, DDTs. So you can le lead to attacks like the billion laughs attacks, the various denial of service based attacks. Um, a similar issue here in Apache Santuario, it's an XML signature attack, uh, again, based on allowing DDTs. Um, so even though the first attack, the first advisory here was in 2010, um, means that CXF doesn't process DDTs and SOAP requests. Um, the problem is that in XML signature, we were using uh, a DOM-based model, and it was processing DDTs for transformations. And there's loads of issues that involve using XSLT or XPath. I'm just going to check the... Uh... OK, so my two attacks have finished running here. And you see they're both vulnerable. So this kind of tool is really invaluable if you want to test uh, how secure your endpoint or your project might be against uh, these kind of denial of service-based attacks. OK, so just some closing remarks. I think it's very important to be transparent and open in how you handle security advisories, um, because in my opinion, it promotes confidence in a project. So we go back to the CXF security page. In my opinion, like when you see a page like this, you know that the project is taking security seriously. Um, it's very easy to hide away and maybe not report issues that you might find. But uh, to me, this demonstrates trust in the issue. It shows that somebody is working at the project that cares about uh, security. 
So again, don't, uh, don't be tempted to keep things secret. Um, on the flip side, you don't need to give too, too much information about how to reproduce an attack um, in the advisory for obvious reasons. Um, and then finally, I think it's a good thing to uh, build a relationship with people in the community. Um, often I've fixed issues pr reasonably promptly and people will come back to me with other issues. Um, I think this is a good thing. So finally, I'll take any questions. Say for example, you're getting psych. Oh. Let's say you're getting psych faults, and that's could or could not be. How would let's say in that case, how would you qualify if it is or is not a security? <sighs> what else would you look for? Well, uh, okay. So typically, if you're at that level of using a project, I would say just communicate with the security person in the project um, directly, rather than go through some kind of open process. Um, Again, like just back to my previous point about just reproducing an issue. You know, if you've got a test case to reproduce the issue, I'd look into it and. But you wouldn't want to do that just for every single bug. Right, but I mean, for a security specific bug. Well, that's what I mean. How, do you, how can a person look at it and classify is this, do I think this is security or not? But well, typically, like in the case of a web service kind of stack, you'll have. There'll be some, it'll either be some kind of denial of service type thing where you're crashing something or using up, slowing something down, or else it'll be some kind of authentication bypass or authorization bypass or something like that. It would, yeah, exactly, yeah. So like this, like an endpoint should be able to handle any kind of data and report it without crashing. Yeah, so. Any questions now? Yeah, good. Wrap it up. Okay, thank you.